And the more you give to me, the more God loves you. And God loves you just the way you are. Forget about that sin nonsense. Do what feels right. They are preaching a worldly doctrine, and the world applauds, and the world gives, and the world loves them because of their lies and their false teaching. They like that position. They like that job. They're not about to give up the popularity and the money and the prestige that comes with telling people what they want to hear. They're not going to trade it for the word of the Lord, not if his prophet say so, not if the Son of God himself should appear. Are they willing to change their ways? As outrageous as this may seem to us, in hindsight, it's not all that uncommon to those of us caught in our own sin because of our own weakness. It's everywhere in the world today. It's everywhere in the world today among people who profess the name of Jesus Christ and call themselves Christians. Because what underpins Herod, what underpins the chief priests and the scribes and their attitude is this all essential problem of how much God needs them. God sends prophets to them to tell them to start preaching the truth after all they have done for him. They brought in so many new people by preaching down a watered-down fake version of it. Isn't that good? They made people feel okay with the way things are. Isn't that good? They've devoted their life to preaching and teaching to make people feel better about themselves, not to lead them to repentance. And isn't that really ultimately good? Do think God just, he love and he wants you to feel better about yourself? They've been out there busy fixing the law of God. They've been changing the doctrine of God to make it better for the human race and our needs and desires felt needs. And boy, after all they've done for God, he has the audacity to say, you haven't kept the covenant by preaching and teaching what I have said. <coughs> this is everywhere in the world where the truth of Jesus is watered down in order to try to fill seats where the truth of Jesus Christ is thrown out the window to make people feel good. It leads to distressing lack of faith everywhere we find it. We have whole church bodies in the world who do not believe in the divinity of Christ or his resurrection from the dead. That means they're not Christians, not by the definition of the creed, but all of that nonsense about bloodshed and God having to die, it makes people uncomfortable. So we will preach sermons about love and forgiveness and compassion, forgiveness from what we're not sure because we never say that there's any such thing as sin. It's out there in the world, the self-justification of the chief priests who think they've done something for God. And brothers and sisters, that is the most basic and deeply rooted of all heresies that come naturally to us because of sin. We do it too. We think we've done something for God. We think that it's great when we show up that God's happy to see us here. It's not a mystery to the Lord who gives us the gift of faith, who gives us the Spirit. He that made sure that we showed up today did it for us. And yet all false forms of Christianity, all false forms of worship, the dispensing with the liturgy for the praise band, not evil in itself, but the details of that is all of this very concept that says what we do at church is us doing for you, Jesus. We come to show you how much we love you, and we do all this for you, and we get something in return. The chief priests and the scribes felt like they weren't getting enough in return after all they did for God. But of course, if they get rid of the prophets and they get rid of the Son of God, God will have nowhere to turn to except back to his ordained priesthood, and they will keep their phony baloney job, their fake doctrine, their soft lifestyle, and they will keep patting people on the back on their way to hell just because it tickles their flesh. And they will tell themselves that they're better than God because they've made his message nice. 
You and I arrive at church with absolutely nothing. We have came into this world naked, and we leave it naked, and we arrive here naked. Nothing is hidden from God. Nothing is disguised from His sight. God knows what we are. And he knows that anything good that ever comes of us is because he's doing it. We didn't show up this morning because we're doing something for God. We were drugged here by the Holy Spirit because he's already doing something for us. All of this essence of the gospel runs one way. If you and I could figure it out for ourselves, do good works, make right decisions, there's no reason for Christ to die on the cross. We could have been circumcised, wore a yarmulke, got more mitzvah, joined the temple sacrifices, learned to keep the law like a good Pharisee, Sadducee, and a scribe. But that's not how it works. That's never how it works. It has always been that only by faith alone do works follow. Only because God finds us dead and makes us alive, he finds us like the good Samaritan. He finds us bloody, beaten, and left for dead on the road of life because of our sin, because of Satan and the powers of darkness. God scoops us up. And just like that parable, he takes us to the innkeeper, to the church, to the place where we can receive medicine of eternal life. He pays the deposit for our wellness. He promises the innkeeper, he promises us all, that anything shortcoming on our end, he will cover when he returns again to the judgment day. Never, ever once in our lives will you and I, by our own power, our own strength, our own choice, do one single thing for Jesus that we can then come to church and say, look, Lord, look what I did for you. In fact, anything we've done for him is because he already did it in us. He called us by the Spirit regenerated us, filled us with his word, gave us a new and alien righteousness that didn't come from our sinful flesh and our rebellious soul, but that came only from him. Nothing less than a new life, so much so that he calls it being born again, being regenerated by him in the waters of baptism. Jesus does the work. The problem with the Sadducees, those chief priests and scribes, the problem with Herod is the slippery slope. They were down at a peak, at a depth, in a valley of evil that begins with something that is so common and ordinary to us. But it's the premise that was wrong. The premise of the false doctrine that we keep the law in order to benefit God. That what we offer God is us doing for Him. That as slight as that seems, as much as it seems like semantics, is the slippery slope that ends at a bottom where isn't God lucky to have us? Doesn't he owe us after all we've done for him? But at the top of that peak, before that slope, is the truth. That Jesus on the cross is the one that cancels out everything evil we've ever done. Jesus on the cross receives, releases the Holy Spirit into the world with his final breath. The Spirit that enters us, enlivens, quickens, resurrects and makes us new. Not because we deserve it, but because we didn't. Not because of good works we did for him, but because of works he does for us. Because we are powerless, but he is all powerful. In his name, amen. <laughs>
and for all people according to their need. For the peace from above, for our salvation, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, Lord, in your mercy. For this holy house, and for all whom the Holy Spirit offers here in their service and praise, especially Kathy, Arden, and Gary, and for all the children of the church, Lord, in your mercy. For the President of these United States, all our government officials and military personnel, and all rulers of all nations, that peace and the word and will of God might be on our hearts and minds, Lord, in your mercy. For Matthew, David, and Carl, our shepherds and bishops in Christ, that they might be upheld by the Holy Spirit as ministers of the gospel, Lord, in your mercy. For all the enemies of Christ's church and his gospel, that they might nevertheless be blessed by him, Lord, in your mercy. For all the sick and the suffering and armament, especially Richard, Robin, Joan, Mark, Steve, Ross, Kathy, David, Scott, Bernie, Margaret, Abby, Ethan, Annie, Shelley, David, Norm, Nicholas, Margie, Landon, Jim, Tabitha, Carl, Mira, Ezekiel, Patricia, Rich, Debbie, Richard, Jeff, and Rhonda. That Christ would be their good physician of body and soul in every need, Lord, in your mercy. For all people in need or distress throughout the world, for all those to whom death is drawing near, for us all, that when our last hour may come, we may depart this life with the confidence of a true faith, and be seated at the wedding feast of the Lamb, his kingdom, which has no end. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer, O Lord, strengthen, deliver, and preserve us. For to you alone we ascribe our glory, honor, and power, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your heart. We lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels, archangels, all saints, and the whole company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore praising you, and then praying in your name, and as you have taught us, our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and we are designed to be patient, but deliver us and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood, the New Testament, which is shed for you for the remission of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may His face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you 